In the beginning, we are told, a voice spoke out in the endless depths of space to say, let there be light. Constantly and always since that day, the visible light which flashes between the stars has been paced by a powerful twin, the unseen glow of radioactivity produced by the monstrous nuclear furnaces which are those stars. They issue bursting floods of radiation and showers of particles too tiny to be matter as we conceive it. Radiation and particles which flash through all space until they strike other matter. And in their striking, they alter that matter and create still new flares of radioactivity. Dead asteroids, suns, moons, or green planets. All matter in space receives this constant rain of radioactivity. So radioactivity is no new thing on Earth. In addition to the cosmic bombardment, creation planted unstable atoms in the Earth itself. They are in our mountains, in the air we breathe, in our food, and in the cells of our bodies. Relatively rare, but still vast in number, they decay one by one, here and there, in a total of countless myriads, in a barrage of inconceivably tiny and silent explosions. Each explosion is another spark of radioactivity. So all life on Earth has reached its present shape in company with this all-pervading haze of radioactivity. Extremely thin, with extremely low-level intensity, it has always been with us. It is nothing new. That's how it was when nature got along without man's help. What is new, what has made this report necessary, is man's most recent discovery of ways to produce concentrated and powerful radioactivity. A number of people who first refined and worked with the radioactive metal radium suffered injuries before its dangers were even suspected. The discoverers and early workers with x-rays were also injured in a number of cases. However, these were limited, short-range hazards, affecting, as a rule, only those people doing the actual work. Today, the development of thermonuclear weapons, H-bombs, has enlarged the dimensions of danger. Explosion of such weapons can affect large numbers of people at great distances. Now, there's been considerable public concern and discussion of fallout, particularly worldwide fallout, both from the standpoint of a future war and as a result of past bomb testings. The future is inaccessible, but we can look at the past and estimate its consequences. However, it appears that the estimation is not carried out as easily as it is suggested. There are too many unknowns, too many complex specialties involved for simplicity. Nuclear physics, meteorology, soil science, plant biology, chemistry, biochemistry, statistics, genetics, political science, mathematics, medicine, each of these has important things to say. Scientists from some of the world's most famous institutions have helped with this work. And what is surprising is that final disagreements are so relatively small among the experts who speak in their own fields of competence. Their overall evaluations are strikingly similar, though they may have gotten there by different routes. Now, let us examine the nature of nuclear fallout, which starts when atoms of uranium and other bomb materials are fissioned or split to release energy. The leftover fragments of the shattered atoms make up scores of new elements and isotopes that were not there before. Almost all of these fission products are radioactive, some of them violently so. For example, a very small one kiloton nuclear explosion creates only about two ounces of fission products. However, one minute after the shot, these two ounces have a radioactivity equal to 100,000 tons of pure radium. Whatever the size of the explosion, the fission products rise high into the air inside the fiery bomb cloud. They constitute the fallout material. How soon they will reach the ground again and where depends on a great many factors. 
The most important are the power of the explosion and the height above ground at which it occurs. Low altitude bursts on or close to the ground will suck into the fireball and vaporize considerable quantities of dirt or sand. Carried aloft in the cloud, this material will cool and condense into particles ranging in size from pinheads down to total invisibility. Most of the fission products will be trapped inside these same dirt particles. As the bomb cloud drifts downwind, all of the largest and heaviest particles fall to the earth in the next few hours or days. This material that deposits rather quickly in a direct trail downwind from the explosion site is referred to as local fallout. It is called local whether it reaches only a few miles downwind, as from a small explosion, or whether its pattern of danger is several hundred miles long, as in the case of very large weapons. Now this fresh fallout emits great quantities of deadly but invisible gamma rays, like the output of a mammoth X-ray machine. Fortunately, the radioactivity will decay rather quickly with the passage of time. Two days after the explosion, it is weakened by a factor of 100. And after two weeks, it retains only one one-thousandth of its first hour's fury. However, until it does decay to relative harmlessness, unshielded persons in the hot areas will suffer injury or death. Reasonably well-shielded persons will probably suffer no physical harm whatever. It is that simple. A reasonably good shielding from local fallout is not very hard to obtain. It is not very expensive to construct. That is the urgent message of our civil defense authorities. It is important that every American should hear that advice. It is not, however, the main concern of this particular report. Our objective is to examine the facts of life of worldwide fallout a much more complicated subject than the local variety. From a nuclear surface burst, we have seen that something like three quarters of the fission products end up in the sizable particles that gravity pulls down to the ground rather in rather short order. The remaining fission products are trapped in particles a great deal smaller, so small that they cannot even be seen in an ordinary microscope. Now this is a case with almost all fission products from any high airburst in which no ground dirt is taken up into the fireball. Nearly all of the resulting fallout particles are of this very small type. So small that tens of thousands of them could be piled on top of a single pinhead. In fact, they are only a trifle larger than the particles of air itself, so they pay very little attention to the laws of gravity. They would drift around the world almost indefinitely if they were not grounded by some special means. Now, these particles are the basis of worldwide fallout. The special means that can bring them down to the ground are found in the structure of the Earth's atmosphere and weather. We'll now listen to a meteorologist for a description of this process. The earliest part of the meteorology story is visible to anyone who observes a typical low-power surface detonation. As, for instance, at the Nevada test site, the cooling bomb cloud from a small explosion will carry its deadly cargo only a few miles high before it cools enough to become stable and then begins the downwind drift. As we have seen, the heavy particles fall out promptly. However, the ultra-lightweight particles of worldwide fallout type drift on and on until such time as they are caught up by either rain or snow and literally washed out of the sky. On average, this happens rather quickly a matter of weeks at most. This scavenging or cleansing action can take place only because of the worldwide type come to ground after the better part of a year or more in the stratosphere, their intense radioactivity has completely disappeared. There's practically no radiation left except from a small amount of rather sedate, low intensity fission products. Those which concern us principally have life periods ranging from several years to thousands of years. They can do no harm unless they are taken into our bodies with food or drinking water or in the air we breathe. Since there is so little of this material, so widely scattered, and of such weak radioactivity that very sensitive instruments are required to find it at all, how do researchers know where it is in the air and on the ground? Well, this knowledge is a result of many years of careful work by many private and governmental agencies.
Since the earliest testing days at the Nevada Proving Ground, monitors have examined the surrounding ground after every detonation. Aircraft have tracked the drifting clouds and even flown through them at early times while radioactivity was still high. Samples of cloud material were secured by these planes and flown quickly to the laboratories for detailed analysis. The same types of cloud tracking and sampling missions were flown from the coral atolls in the Pacific Proving Ground after each of the big thermonuclear shots. Fallout collecting containers and sticky papers were also placed on arrays of rafts spaced across the ocean at intervals for many miles from the shot islands. Similar collections were made at a number of Pacific Island sites during the test. Even the food inside the fish was investigated. In the United States and several other countries, there have long been programs in action in key cities and rural areas to monitor fallout concentrations both from the air and from soil analysis. One of the most important sampling jobs paid no attention to ground level fallout. It operated directly in the stratosphere itself to measure how much bomb material was actually there and where and at what rate it was drifting back into the troposphere. Half a dozen of the now famous U-2 high altitude research aircraft were assigned to this project for a number of years. Outfitted with complicated filters, these aircraft flew numerous long range missions from bases in Argentina, Puerto Rico, and the United States. Their sampling passes were oriented north and south to intercept concentrations of bomb debris on the east-west stratospheric winds. The findings of this program showed clearly that more than half of the accumulated radioactivity from all testing had drained out of the stratosphere within a year after the Soviets temporarily ended their large-scale test explosions in the fall of 1958. It had previously been thought that this would take five to ten years. The new information was very welcome. It meant that the peak of worldwide fallout from previous testing was passed and that the long-range hazard was substantially less than was formerly believed. However, the exact nature and degree of that hazard, present and future, is something that no one today can define exactly, even limiting the discussion to the area on which we have the most data, the pre-1959 tests. Research for this report has brought out the somewhat remarkable situation that no expert of established competence in this field is willing to claim that his estimates of biological hazard are very much more than educated guesses, particularly when the estimates use any actual numbers. Listen to a portion of the statement with which one respected authority ended a discussion of fallout effects in his field. I should like to emphasize the crudity of these calculations and the tenuousness of the assumptions, and especially the necessity of relying entirely on experimental animals. The calculations may be seriously wrong, and may give only a very rough idea of the probable magnitudes involved. That statement was a typical one. The difficulty is that while there is quite a lot of information on large radiation doses, there is literally none in the field of extremely small doses spread over entire human lifetimes, as is in the case of worldwide fallout. The radioactive elements of fallout that are now believed to be potentially most hazardous are cesium-137, strontium-90, and carbon-14. Some of the cesium and strontium deposited on edible plants and on the soil around them is taken into the plants directly through their leaves. Somewhat less is eventually taken up through their root systems. Then we eat those plants or we consume the meat and milk of animals which eat them. After being taken into the body, the two isotopes behave in different ways. We'll consider this cesium-137 first. This isotope, once swallowed, spreads throughout the body. It is retained in the body for several months, emitting gamma radiation all the while. The remainder of the deposited cesium, still on the ground outside our bodies, is of course also radioactive. On average, we receive about the same tiny gamma radiation dose from this external material 
as from the internal cesium that we have swallowed. We also receive gamma radiation from a few other fallout isotopes mixed in with the cesium. These, having very short lives, become insignificant after the first couple of years instead of lasting for several decades as does the cesium-137. We will lump them in with the cesium for the rest of this discussion. Keep in mind that the gamma radiation from these materials is no stranger. It is the same penetrating whole body radiation that has always bathed humanity from the natural background sources, from cosmic rays, from the earth, from our food and water, and from the very bricks in our walls. Gamma radiation may do its damage in either of two major ways, or both. One, it may physically and directly destroy tissue or eventually cause the development of some kind of cancer. These are forms of what is called somatic injury. Number two, the radiation may cause genetic injury, which we'll define a little later. For both of these types of injury, the crucial question is, how much radiation does it take? The old X-ray unit for measuring radiation is the Rentgen. A roughly similar unit, the REM, is more widely used for discussing biological effects because it makes allowance for the fact that some kinds of radiation are more effective than others in damaging living organisms. The peculiar thing about radiation is that its effect is dependent on the rate at which it is received. One analogy might be the wind. A person who experiences a gentle breeze each day for many years would hardly notice it. Yet, that same total amount of wind could be deadly if it arrived in a single hurricane. A gamma radiation dose that would certainly kill a person if received at a single sitting may do him no detectable harm at all if it is received in tiny installments spread over a period of, say, 30 years. Such a large total dose as that might make the person slightly more likely to develop cancer eventually, but even this is completely unproven and highly uncertain. Now, remembering that uncertainty, consider how uncertain we must be about a far smaller 30-year total dose, several hundred times smaller. That is approximately what we all receive from natural background radiation, so little that its biological effects, if any, are totally undetectable, a matter of guesswork only. If we now do still another division, down to less than one-fiftieth of the tiny background dose, we finally arrive at the size of the cesium-137 dose that the average person may pick up in the 30-year period starting in 1954. Only one or two percent of the background dose for the same period. This is in the Northern Hemisphere, too, which contains most of the fallout material. Now, let's look at the way these items shape up in actual figures. That REM unit, which we met a moment ago, is not very handy for measuring such extremely weak radiation levels. Instead, we'll use a much smaller unit, one one-thousandth of a REM, called a millirem. In terms of this unit, the 30-year natural background dose that we all receive without noticing it is some three to five thousand millirem. Everybody gets it. Depending on where you live and how your home is built, it may be easily twice that amount. By contrast, the 30-year gamma dose from cesium-137 will total only some 70 millirem, less than one-tenth of one rem, less than two percent of the natural background dose. It turns out that science has no adequate experimental basis that would justify a claim of any somatic injury effects from a dose this small. Now we come to the genetic effects of the penetrating cesium-137 radiation. These are potentially the most long-lasting and important effects that worldwide fallout might have. So they've received a great deal of careful study. We'll listen now to a geneticist for a discussion of these effects. Genetics research has thoroughly established the fact that gamma radiation in sufficient quantities can damage or change the microscopically small genes inside of human reproductive cells. Excessive warmth or chemical agents can also do this. There are many thousands of genes in each cell. In effect, they constitute the blueprints for construction 
of new human beings, our children. The full blueprints are composed of one batch of genes from the mother and another assortment from the father. If radiation alters or mutates some of the genes inherited from either parent, this amounts to altering some of the figures in the blueprints that will govern the building of their child. Furthermore, the child will pass the damaged blueprints on to all of his descendants. It necessarily takes many generations, hundreds of years, for a mutated gene to be inherited by enough people to become widely distributed in the general population. As this takes place, the possibility gradually increases that both partners of any given marriage may chance to be carriers of the same mutated gene. Their child will then experience the maximum effects of the mutation. This blueprint change may appear essentially harmless, calling for the child to be much taller than average, or to be prone to early baldness, or green eyes, or triplets in the family. There may be, and probably are, other less visible effects. Since human beings are enormously intricate and carefully balanced machines, most random mutational changes are likely to be undesirable or annoying to at least some extent. The mutation may be a lethal one that prevents conception or will kill the child before birth. It may cause a later tendency toward allergies or some painful disease. The possibilities are literally endless. The full story of the effects of any one human mutation can never be clearly mapped out because they are concealed by or blended with the results of the countless millions of ancient mutations that are distributed so widely in our population. The development of humanity to its present shape, both mental and physical, has been governed by these myriad mutations occurring at random through the endless centuries. Many of the mutations are still harmful. To others, we owe all the good things in the way we are built. While a mutation seldom has full effect if inherited from only one parent, it can have substantial effect. Sometimes that effect seems completely desirable. Sometimes completely undesirable. Sometimes there are contradictory aspects. For example, there is one gene widely distributed in some African populations, which, if inherited from both parents, causes the dangerous sickle cell anemia. Surprisingly, those who inherit the gene from only one parent have a selective advantage, a considerable immunity to malaria. So, to make a very generalized summary, the geneticist sees mutation as a prime and necessary agent in the progress of man's evolution. Yet in any single case, more likely to be undesirable than beneficial. That leaves us with the major question, how little an amount of radiation will cause how many mutations? Once again, the answer is no one knows, though there are plenty of speculations. Medical records tell us that a small percentage of all children are born with hereditary defects, ranging from slight to serious. Some authorities have made very cautious guesses that a few of those genetic defects might be the result of natural background radiation through the ages. This is speculation, of course, neither proven nor provable. It merely seems more likely that background radiation had something to do with it than nothing to do with it. How then? Can anyone assess the full probable results of cesium-137 radiation when it is only 1 or 2 percent as intense as the faint background radiation, particularly when the cesium itself will mostly disappear within the next few decades? The answer is obvious. No competent authority does assess the results with any pretense of accuracy. However, using some United Nations reports and radiation studies on fruit flies and small animals, and ignoring the fact that these do not apply very exactly, it is possible to theorize that the cesium-137 from past testing might introduce several hundred new mutations into the human genetic pool each year for the next dozen years or so on a worldwide basis. 
To evaluate the importance of these hundreds, we must next realize that each of those years will also see the production of some 10 million new mutations from purely natural causes, of the types that have always been with us, totaling some 200,000 times as many as from the cesium. Medical science has greatly softened the sometimes harmful consequences of past mutations. What it will be able to do about new mutations is just as unguessable as the shapes those mutations will take. So much then for the genetic aspects of the 30-year cesium dose of 70 milligram, the same whole body dose that we first considered from purely somatic aspects. I mentioned earlier the radioactive carbon-14 was a nuclear explosion product considered potentially hazardous. Like the cesium isotope, it can be combined into the tissues of all parts of the body, thereby reaching the genetic cells directly. Now, while carbon-14 has a life of thousands of years, most of that which was produced by the past testing will be absorbed into the ground and the oceans within the present generation. On average, it will give each of us a 30-year total dose of less than 5 milligram. Since it is a whole body dose, we can lump it in with the cesium-137 as having possibilities of both somatic and genetic effects, uncertain though they may be. In view of the great uncertainties, it has been very difficult for governmental and international health agencies to decide what limits of what kind of radiation are reasonably safe or acceptable for unavoidably exposed people. Limits of this sort are something like speed limits. There is no positive guarantee of safety when you are under the limit, but there is a good likelihood that you are unsafe if you exceed it very far. For radiation, the limit is called the MPD, standing for maximum permissible dose. It can refer to immediate whole body doses or to total doses accumulated over definite periods of time. It is always a level that is well below that which has been observed to cause injury or which can conservatively be expected to do so. There is very good agreement between the limits suggested by the leading agencies in the business, the Federal Radiation Council, the National Committee for Radiation Protection and Measurement, and the International Commission for Radiological Protection. They all feel that for the bulk of the population in general, the maximum permissible dose of whole body radiation should not exceed 5,000 millirem for any 30-year period, above and beyond the background radiation and any medical exposure such as x-rays. Contrast this 5,000 limit with the mere 75 millirem that we will actually receive from whole body fallout radiation. Note also that medical exposures alone will give us an average 30-year dose of some 3,000 millirem, certainly with no expectation of undue risk. This brings us to the most widely discussed fission product, strontium-90. Chemically similar to the soil calcium with which it becomes mixed, the strontium-90 follows calcium through its regular cycles into our plant foods and into the bones, meat, and milk of our plant-eating animals. Reaching our own bodies, the strontium-90, like calcium, tends to be concentrated in our bones, particularly those of children who are building new bones. The radiation from strontium-90 has extremely short range in the body, so it causes no genetic threat to the reproductive cells. It does pose a threat to the bone marrow and the bone itself in the form of either leukemia or bone cancer. Typically, these diseases take years to develop, so very little long-term study of this hazard has been possible to date. A much point has been made of the fact that strontium does not deposit evenly throughout the skeleton. Instead, it tends to create hot spot areas in some bones where the concentration may be 2 to 20 times higher than an average would be. Now, other researchers counter this argument by pointing out that if a given body burden of strontium is concentrated in a few areas, then the other areas of bone and marrow must be correspondingly less threatened. But for what it's worth, the highest strontium-90 concentration that has ever been found in young bones since fallout became a problem is at least 100 times lower than the least that has been found capable of causing cancer in mice. 
But here again, we face the difficulty of comparing mice and men. Some mice are very cancer prone. Others are almost immune. Humans may be equally variable. For our records, we list strontium-90 in the somatic category only because it does not constitute any genetic threat. Now, from a safety standpoint, you'll remember that the total 30-year maximum permissible dose of this whole body radiation was set at 5,000 millirem. Now, for strontium-90 radiation, the best approximation is 5,600 millirem. Now, contrast this with the latest and most authoritative calculation that from strontium-90, from all past testing, will give the bones of today's children an average 30-year total dose of only 75 millirem. Adults, their skeletons already formed, will pick up only one-fifth of this dose, some 15 millirem. So, what exactly do these strontium figures amount to? Once again, no one is doing much better than guessing. Working from the best available data, and again, with a lot of ifs, it can be computed that this strontium-90 from past tests might produce something like a dozen new leukemia or bone cancer cases in the roughly 200 million population of the United States each year for the next 30 to 50 years. Of course, there may be no increase at all, as the United Nations Scientific Committee was careful to point out. In any case, during these same years, we do know that there will be approximately 50,000 cases of leukemia from perfectly natural causes, having nothing to do with fallout. Now, inspecting this array of statistics, it is quite clear that the full radiation doses received from worldwide fallout will be extremely small compared to the natural background levels the maximum permissible doses, or to the harmless total of routine chest and dental x-rays which we will all receive. Yet, all the point has been made that no one has proved that such small doses will do the slightest harm. It is equally true that no one has proved they will not. Some public figures have said that the risks are close to zero. Others, proclaiming that the risk is enormous, have juggled figures recklessly multiplying and remultiplying statistics which were never more than guesswork in the first place. It is highly questionable whether this is a reasonable way to handle hazard statistics when the areas of ignorance are so extremely large. Reviewing the evidence, it seems quite possible, even if not provable, that a few score or even hundreds of people may experience shortened or uncomfortable lives because of worldwide fallout acting through the coming generations. If this should happen, it would be a tragic thing for those injured, no matter how small the number. Whether these statistically very few casualties can be justified is a personal value judgment outside the scope of this report. Each citizen must make his or her own evaluation. There are those few who loudly maintain that there is no actual threat to the free world at all, certainly none that can justify either nuclear testing or nuclear armament. The opposite viewpoint holds that the development of our nuclear power has been an absolutely necessary protection against communist hostility and nuclear threats. In this view, the fallout casualties, if any, will be seen as those of unidentified soldiers in the service of humanity, unknown soldiers in a war which has not struck and which our nuclear power may indeed prevent from ever striking. Beyond this, it should certainly be remembered that while fallout may conceivably kill or injure some hundreds of persons in the coming generations, we suffer vastly greater losses every year from causes which seem to excite very little public interest or reaction. Automobile exhausts and oil furnaces continuously contaminate our air with lead and with benzpyrene in large quantities, both of them known for 30 years to be powerful cancer-causing agents. There were over 6,000 deaths in a single smog attack in England a few years ago. There was a killing smog in Denora, Pennsylvania. There are many cities with poisoned air. We are suffering virtual epidemics of lung cancer and heart disease, almost certainly man-made. For some curious psychological reason, none of these, nor many other large and substantial hazards, seem to provoke the blind public alarm that tends to flare up at the mere mention of the word radiation. I hope that this report will supply the information needed to bring the relative importance of these hazards into truer focus. 
Now a summary statement. A careful survey of the best available evidence suggests strongly that in comparison to the many, many risks that we all face in today's feverish world, the risk of even minor injury from worldwide fallout is completely insignificant.